Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Ellen McNally. I'm MD Everywhere Sales and Marketing Project Manager. For those of you not familiar with MD Everywhere, we are a single source revenue cycle management and EMR solution provider with technology and best practice medical billing services proven to improve the claims process, decrease denials, and increase collections 10 to 15 percent. I do want to thank you all for joining us today on our webinar on HIPAA, privacy, security enforcement, and breach notification rules. Our presenter is attorney, New York attorney, Jennifer Kirschenbaum. She is the managing partner of Kirschenbaum and Kirschenbaum PC's healthcare department. Uh, Jennifer devotes her practice towards assisting practitioners in all aspects of private practice, office-based surgery practice, Article 28 facility formation and operation, independent practice association formation and operation, as well as hospital-based practice and hospital relationships arrangements. Jennifer specializes in representing practitioners in regulatory compliance, transactional licensure defense, third-party payer audits, and litigation matters. She's an expert. Before I do turn the presentation over to Jennifer, I do want to couple of, cover a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be shared with all registrants via email. We will also make available a copy of the PowerPoint presentation in a PDF uh, format as part of our follow-up process for those who would like a copy of it. Okay. While attendees will be muted during the presentation, we know that you may have some questions. So we do, do invite you to use the uh, chat questions window on the lower part of your control panel. You can type in your questions. We won't have time for those questions on the call today. We have over 300 people registered for this call today. Uh, but if you do submit your questions, Jennifer or someone at MD Everywhere will follow up with you in, uh, after the webinar and make sure that your questions are answered. Okay. Uh, also, we want to let you know that this will be an interactive presentation today. We have two uh, survey questions that we will be posting during the presentation. And we do encourage all of you to participate when those polls are activated. It gives Jennifer more information to feed off of while she's doing uh, that particular set of content. Okay, so without any further delay, again, thank you for your time. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Jennifer Kirschenbaum for her presentation on HIPAA privacy, security, enforcement, and breach notification rules. Jennifer? Ellen, thank you so much uh, for having me today and also for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be here to educate on HIPAA and uh, what we have going on. So just to start um, for our agenda, let me get this working, okay. We, we did get an intro that we're going to cover the HIPAA privacy rule, security rule, and breach notification rule. And for those of us who are not aware, last January, new law was uh, promulgated and became effective this past September in 2013. And there are now new requirements that we all have to abide by as covered entities dealing with patient information. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So just a primer, I know everyone on the line has a basic understanding of HIPAA, which um, just to cover, HIPAA is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, and it is H-I-P-A-A. -A. a lot of people spell it like they think it sounds, and they say H-I-P-P-A, and you will certainly know if you are not dealing with an educated person on HIPAA if they're not spelling it the correct way, which is H-I-P-A-A. -A. So just to clarify, and a bit of a pet peeve as a healthcare attorney uh, for the HIPAA spelling. The privacy rule, uh, as we're aware, provides federal protections for personal health information held by covered entities. And it specifies a number of rights that patients have related to their information and how that information should be maintained. Uh, and today we're gonna cover most of the changes. I just wanted to talk about briefly that the, the privacy rule is so vast that I could easily give probably a week-long dissertation on all of the elements of it. So we're not going to spend an incredible amount of time going over all of the nuances, but I'll hit some of the key um, definitions that we need for our purposes today. And then I want to spend some time discussing what's going on in the regulatory world and oversight, and we'll go over some case examples later on in our discussion. And I'm sorry that our discussion is one way, but that's the way these webinars are generated. So the security rule, which was added uh, after HIPAA was originally put in place, is becoming a lot more relevant now that we're all switching to electronic records. And the security rule governs the treatment of electronic protected health information. 
And under the new High Tech Act, not that it's that new, but um, elements of it that we are all become a, becoming a lot more aware of because of the meaningful use requirements under Medicare and uh, general use of electronic data, um, the security rule is what dictates the administrative, physical, and technical safeguards that each of our covered entities are required to have in place when dealing um, with electronic information. And that includes, of course, general encryption. I know we're all dealing with that. It's dealing with um, continuing on with your Windows XP after Microsoft drops support. You know, is that going to arguably be HIPAA compliant? Um, so the security rule is what deals with this. And it, it's incredibly important. And we'll, we'll get into some of its requirements later. So basic definitions that are going to help us with our conversation today is um, uses and disclosures and what a covered entity may or may not disclose for protected health information. And we'll get to protected health information later. Um, but uses and disclosures, we're allowed to disclose to an individual for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations purposes, and we'll get to that further down, pursuant to a valid authorization and by agreement, which by agreement would be the individual agreeing to the disclosure. We are also required to disclose um, if there is a request by uh, the government or a proper judicial request from, um, let's say, a court. Now, valid authorization, we get authorizations every single day, um, a lot of times from lawyers. And sometimes they're valid, sometimes they're not. How do you know? Well, uh, there's, form, there's a, an approved form, federal form authorization. And if you receive that and it's filled out appropriately, I would tell you that it's OK to disclose information. If you're not sure, before you disclose, you should check. Because your obligation is to maintain um, proper records on file and to uh, make sure that you're not disclosing uh, unauthorized, an unauthorized party. So if you have a question about an authorization, question first, don't send. Um, make sure that you double check with your health care attorney whether or not it's a proper authorization. This is a new change to the HIPAA laws. And I'm sorry if this is a little confusing that we're not going through um, all of the, the background, but just to explain, I think this is a very important one to highlight. Healthcare operations, and we're going back now to just take a quick look at, we're allowed to disclose now for healthcare operations. Typically, um, previously, we were allowed to only disclose for treatment and payment operations and not necessarily healthcare general operations. So this is a new definition for us under HIPAA, and it means any of the following activities of a covered entity to the extent that the activities are related to covered functions. And so why is this important? We now have to disclose to insurance companies, if they ask, for quality assessment, okay, and improvement activities. Previously, we only had to disclose for payment, meaning we want something from you. We want to get paid, so we'll give you a copy of the patient record. And we'll give you limited information specifically tailored to the treatment dates um, to back up why we want to get paid. Now, under HIPAA, the patient does not have to give a new authorization. The authorization that they're signing in your office authorizing care is enough to allow an insurance company to come back and say, we want to look at the records again, or we're going to look at the records for the first time for quality assessment and improvement activities. This allows the insurance companies really carte blanche access to patient records in your office. And it's incredibly dangerous from my perspective as far as um, documentation requirements and making sure that everything you have in the practice is actually backing up what you're billing for. Um, because previously, they didn't have the ability to go in and do an open audit like this, really. Um, it really was much more limited. Now they can go in under a number of different uh, guises and request access. And I think you know it's really, really troublesome in my mind. So just be aware of that as we go further on today, because um, we're going to talk about enforcement actions that are going on right now, and, and those are also very scary. So basic definitions that I want to make sure we understand. Covered entity is what HIPAA applies to, and that includes a health plan, a clearinghouse, or any provider who transmits any health information. So <coughs> that would include any medical practice, or hospital or nursing home. Um, Individually identifiable health information, what is covered? Sorry, I just had a throat tickle, which is a bit of a bother. Um, individually identifiable health information, this is what has to be protected. And this is very important. This is exactly what it sounds like. Anything that you can use to identify an individual 
that is a patient of your practice or a potential patient of your practice should be protected. And that includes um, any kind of demographic information. It includes a picture. It includes a social security number. It includes a license ID number. Anything that could possibly be linked to one person. I'll give you another example. I was asked by a doctor recently, can I use an x-ray that doesn't identify a patient for my blog um, that I took at the practice? That no one will know it's the patient. Do I even need to get consent from the patient? I said, well, is there anything in there at all? Is there any type of implant? And she said, oh, I didn't think about that. If you have a patient with an implant that has a serial number on it that's visible from an x-ray, if you could trace that back to a person, then it is protected health information and cannot be utilized um, in a manner that is not appropriate under HIPAA. So um, I think we're clear on individual identifiable health information, and that's what has to be protected, anything that's specific to a person that can be traced back. So that would be enough to say a patient was at the practice on this day, you know, even if you, if you had a, a, a vague, not, not necessarily vague, but a specific description of that individual, you would want to be careful. Um, obviously, video, any video that you're taking of the parking lot or the lobby, um, video is appropriate in the medical practice so long as it's not in an area where a patient would have an expectation of privacy. So a changing area or a bathroom obviously would be inappropriate for video. But I encourage practices all the time to utilize video. It's a good way to make sure that um, your staff isn't doing co-pays uh, and that uh, everyone is getting to work on time and also if there's any claims of impropriety, uh, you may possibly have a, uh, a video coverage, which is always good to have on, on site. Um, so protected health information is it, any individually identifiable health information, and it's, it's uh, anything that's transmitted by electronic or maintains electronic media, which we're all doing. Even if we're not doing electronic claims yet, which is TIS we're supposed to be doing by now, but if we're not and we even have a laptop that we use, um, in the office or around to, uh, that, that would be considered electronic and, and would require um, specific protections under HIPAA. Specific changes to protected health information related to um, the new law. Um, now, anything that is in an employment record is no longer considered um, individually identifiable health information. Now, that is um, specific, meaning not something that's held in a, public, in, a, in a health record, but an actual employment record, an employee comes in and um, interviews, let's say, for a job for your, for your practice, um, and you happen to have some demographic information. That's in the employment record, separate from the medical record. It is not technically protection health information. Education record, same thing. If it's specific to the education record, even if it's technically identifiable, um, and as long as it's not mixed in or commingled with the medical record, it's no longer protected health information. You may be thinking, Jennifer, is this really related to our talk? It is, because these are the new changes that came into place, so I'm just making you aware. Um, if it's out of context, I apologize, but these are tips that usually uh, we, we get uh, positive reviews on. Um, information that is also not protect health information, this is under the new law changes. Any individual who is deceased for more than 50 years, um, technically their information would no longer be protected. Now, I will tell you that if any doctors on the line have purchased or inherited Elvis Presley's records, um, please do not disclose them if his 50th anniversary of his death has come up because I can guarantee you that just because it's not protected health information technically doesn't mean that you would not be sued for disclosing um, proprietary information for a public figure. So just bear that in mind. Um, deceased in individual, this is a new change. If you had an individual who has died um, that was in your care and a family member wants to call and talk to you about the uh, circumstances of the death or for payment issues, you used to not really be authorized to speak to this individual because if they were not the patient. Now, under the new changes to the law, you are allowed to disclose minimum information necessary um, for payment or treatment purposes within your discretion as a health care provider to the family member. And this is a change um, from the prior law. It used to not be this case. Speaking of what you should be authorized to disclose, the minimum necessary standard is not new. Um, what it is means that pursuant to HIPAA, each of us as a covered entity has an obligation when using or disclosing protected health information or run requesting information to limit the PHI disclosed to the minimum necessary to accomplish the intended purpose of the use, disclosure, or request. Um, 
What is new is the application of the minimum necessary standard to our business associates. And we're going to spend some more time on business associates in just a minute. So, sorry, I wish I had time for ability to field questions on these issues, but next time. Changes to the business associate rule. Under the new rule, a business associate uh, scope has expanded. And who constitutes a business associate with your practice is a lot broader range. So it's anyone who creates, receives, or maintains, or transmits protected health information for claims processing or administration, data analysis, um, utilization review, quality assurance, patient safety activities, or billing. This is going to cover pretty much anyone who's in and out of your practice other than an employee or other covered entity or government agency that has more than routine access to your system. So if we have any marketing people that are coming in and helping us use our information to get more patients, if we have a billing company, um, if we have a website designer who's going to have access to our system, whether or not they're supposed to be on the EMR or not, if they're remoting in or they're, they have, they're on site um, on our network, all of these individuals are business associates. And all business associates are required to have a contract. Um, the contract should document the services that are being performed by the business associate, of course, the length of the term, and then it has to have specific safeguards in place as to how information should be treated by the business associate and the obligations of the covered entity to maintain that information. And before we get to our poll, I just want to make sure that we're clear that a business associate can use protected health information only as permitted or required by its business associate contract. So it's very important that we have with specificity the uses that the business associate can have with our protected health information. And this is going to be especially important because of liability. And you'll see when we get to the, the new breach notification requirements that the potential exposure is severe. And we want to make sure that if it's our billing company, which of course if you're working with MD everywhere, this would never happen because they have a lot of protections in place. Um, but if your billing company were to accidentally lose um, your protected health information for your patients, you would uh, not want to be the one who's held responsible for that. And the way that you do that is, is by contract, you have what's called an indemnification provision, which would be a risk-shifting uh, contractual provision that you are authorized to have in your business associate agreement that basically would say that the business associate will indemnify and hold you harmless for any misuse of the protected health information that's caused by them. And by indemnify and hold harmless, that means that they will pay for any cost or expense associated with their misuse of the information, um, which would essentially absolve you of any monetary exposure. Uh, and they would take responsibility. So it's incredibly, incredibly important that we have these contracts to protect us. And with that, Ellen, I'm going to go to our first poll. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. It's a lot of information so far. And everyone can see that protecting yourself and making sure you've got these agreements in place is important. The first poll has to do with the HIPAA Business Associate Agreement. Very straightforward. Do you have executed HIPAA Business Associate Agreements with your business associates today? Yes, no, or don't know? Do you currently have executed business associate agreements that protect your practice in the event there's a HIPAA violation? We've got about 70% of the audience participating. Let's give it another five seconds to get the rest of you in. Five, four, three, two, and one, we're going to close the poll. And Jennifer, we have a pretty good group on the phone. 67% of them do have executed agreements. 
twelve percent of them don't, and there's another twenty percent that aren't sure. Okay, well, those are great numbers, Ellen, and I'm really glad to hear them. It sounds like we have an educated group that is aware that they have to have their business associate agreements in place. I would recommend that for all of us who are complying that we do take one more look at the documents that we do have on file now and make sure that you are availing yourselves of the opportunity to contract away your potential exposure and make sure that you have an indemnification provision that is to your benefit related to the use of the protected health information that's in your possession. So moving on from contracting, we'll talk about liability. So a covered entity is liable, and this is pursuant to the common law of agency, for civil monetary penalties for violations based on any acts or omissions of their agent. Okay? And um, this was actually recently expanded specifically under the statute it, it was under, under common law this existed, but now specifically under HIPAA, a business associate will be, a covered entity and a business associate both, similarly, would be responsible for an act of their agent. So what is an agency relationship? Um, an agent is someone who is coming in and working under you without a, um, employee designation, okay, and also without an independent contractor status, really. So it's someone who's coming in working under your direction and control um, where you have not specified the relationship and determined who's going to be responsible. So an example of this is we bring in an in-house biller who also has other clients, and she's working directly for you but we do not have a billing contract with this person or a business associate agreement. She also is listed as a 1099 because she really is in control of her own job functions. If this individual takes claims home with her and loses them, her car gets carjacked on the way home, she's having a very bad day, you will be responsible for any liability or money that is owed to the government because of the lost patient information, because this individual is acting as an agent on behalf of your practice. So um, I just want everyone to understand that and make sure that the relationships that they have in their offices right now are defined. This is a, a, a question that I've gotten um, many times before. Um, is a, a covered entity is must, it must provide patient access to electronic health protected health information um, if requested. So if a patient has a request for information and you have an electronic record, you have to give it to them um, electronically. You can't print it out. So that's information that's, that's been requested. And this is also new. A covered entity now respond, must respond to a record request within 30 days after receipt. There used to not be this deadline, um, but now there is. So it's 30 days you have to respond. For some reason, there's some sort of act of God or um, a tornado has taken out your office, um, try to tell the patient why there's a delay and make sure you have it in writing if you're not providing within 30 days because they, they can complain about you. Fees for providing records. This is a big question. We all don't want to lay out any additional expenses. You can charge for the production of records. You can charge for the labor for copying protected health information, supplies, postage, and the time preparing an explanation or summary of the protected health information. I will tell you this, charging patients for anything, anything in addition to what they think they should be paying, which we all know the answer to that is zero, will potentially get you in trouble with the patient and may be cause for them to report you to the Office for Civil Rights, which is the government arm that oversees HIPAA um, compliance and enforcement. So the Office for Civil Rights is no joke. Um, they actually have just increased their mandate, and now they're, they're actively going after practices for noncompliance with HIPAA. And they are required to um, investigate any complaint that they receive. So if a patient calls and says, I was treated inappropriately by Dr. So-and-so's office, they ask me for money for my records, which I'm entitled to get for free. They're my records. I own them, and I don't want to pay the fees. They are required to look into you to see whether or not the charges were appropriate. So 
similar to your attorney's fees, how they come in an, idolize, an itemized receipt, I suggest that if you are going to charge patients for their records, you do so specifying explicitly what it is they're being charged for. Delineate the labor costs. Explain what the supplies are. If you had to buy a thumb drive to put the records on there, make sure that you charge them the cost of the thumb drive and explain what it was you were charged. I had a client get into a lot of trouble with OCR. We had a fight to get him out because he charged a client $65 for an x-ray. He had to pay the um, reproduction company to make a copy of the x-ray $49, and he charged the extra difference for the time in between ordering it and getting it to the patient, he upcharged it $16, and this got him reported. If he had kept an itemized invoice and sent it to the patient, I think that the scrutiny that he came under for that would have been um, a lot quicker and we could have closed it a lot quicker. But to his detriment, this law wasn't in place. Um, it was more vague about charging, and now I think that he would have had less of a hard time uh, with that scenario. So we're going to go over quickly some changes that are required to be in your privacy policies, which each of you are required to have on-site, promulgated, open and available for patients, privacy policies. Um, there are a number of things that have to be added to these policies, and I don't make the rules. You may say, Jennifer, this doesn't apply to us. I don't understand why this has to be in our privacy policy. And my explanation will be, it may not apply to you, but you're required to have it. It's law. And if you do have oversight or someone coming in from Office of Civil Rights to check to make sure that you're in compliance, they will check specifically to make sure that your privacy policies have been updated and that these provisions are on file and available for patients. The first provision has to do with marketing. We are required to have language in our privacy policy that explicitly states um, that, uh, that marketing, if it involves financial remuneration, authorization is going to be required. And that has to be on file. Um, so whether or not you're doing marketing or using patient information for marketing, you are required to have uh, this, this language in your privacy policy. Now, the language isn't specifically stated on here. This is what is required um, by the law. This is the statement that they have in there. Now, marketing means any communication about a product or service that encourages recipi recipients to purchase or use a product or service, except if you're using patient information for refill reminders or treatment purposes, case management, that's not going to be marketing. Fundraising. Jennifer, again, I don't do any fundraising. Why do I need to have this in my privacy policy? You're required under law to have this, this type of statement in your privacy policy, okay, that a, a covered entity may use or disclose um, information for fundraising purposes without an authorization so long as the statement regarding such fundraising is included in the covered entity's privacy policy, so you have to have it. With each fundraising communication, there is an opportunity to opt out, okay, and, uh, and a method to opt back in if necessary. Um, so this has to be in there. Next, what also has to be in there is sale of PHI, if we're going to be selling any protect health information. We are required to have a statement in our notice of uh, privacy policy um, that covers sale of protected health information. Now, I'm sorry if this information isn't the most exciting. I'm going over some new requirements. And the point of this element with the fundraising, the marketing, and the sale, each of these three things are required to be in your privacy policy. And if you have not updated since last January, then you are out of date, and the privacy policy you have on file needs to be thrown out and be replaced with one that's compliant with the law because that's going to be one of the first things that the Office of Civil Rights asks for. If you do have a patient complaint or you are just targeted for just a general audit, and if you don't have it, it's going to be a huge red flag that you are not in compliance with our current regulations. Um, so requirements in our notice of privacy uh, practices. We must have a statement uh, that uses and disclosures of psychotherapy notes also um, is, uh, is addressed. Now, you may say, Jennifer, I am a podiatrist. I have no cause or reason to have psychotherapy notes in my record. That may be fine, but there may come a time where one of your 6,000 active patients, hopefully knock on wood, hope you're doing that well, has a psychotherapy note that for some reason was tucked into a medical record somewhere 
that is now in your possession. HIPAA requires for you to have information in your privacy policy specifying treatment of psychotherapy notes. And that is in conjunction with the changes you need to make for marketing purposes, sale, and for fundraising. Okay? So, our privacy policies have to include a separate provision that cover these areas, and we are going to make sure that that's the case. And if not, then we're going to have to get a new policy. How do we tell patients we have a new policy? This has not changed. We are required to have the policy available at the site where we provide services, posted in a clear and prominent location, and whenever the notice is revised, we have to make it available. So I would recommend posting the new one up in your office. And um, you don't have to physically give this to the patient, but they do have to sign off that they had an opportunity to receive this. And I, I recommend that you put that into your consent to treatment form, that they recognize uh, this opportunity and that they know that they can request it at any time. This is a major change that, um, for those of us who are still listening, uh, is really one of the key elements of the new rule under the, the, the HIPAA laws that changed. So, Recertification rule used to be that we only had to report to the government or to the patient if in our assessment there was actual harm to the patient because of the disclosure. That is not the case anymore. Now, everything that is not authorized is a breach. Except, and we'll go through the exception. So a breach means, and I'm just going to read it here because this is important. This is one of the most important things we're going to go over today. Breach means the acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of protected health information in a manner not permitted under the privacy laws and which compromises the security or privacy of the information. It explicitly excludes the following. Any unintentional acquisition, access, or use by any workforce member, so an employee that is already authorized to be viewing information, if they have access to a patient's chart that maybe is not within the scope necessarily of their direct employment, assuming that they are covered by our internal policies and procedures, meaning that they are an employee of ours, they've signed our employment handbook, they've signed off on our confidentiality agreements, um, and we know that they're not going anywhere and disclosing any of our information, then we are okay that this was not an unauthorized breach. Disclosure from one authorized person to another authorized person. This is a covered entity disclosing to another covered entity. Um, we are authorized to share with other doctor's offices patient information. We are also allowed to disclose protected health information where a covered entity or business associate has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was made would not reasonably have been able to retain such information. So um, let me just rephrase. The, we, are, we are not going to have a breach where the unauthorized person would not have been able to re been retain such information. And I'll give an example of that um, in a second. So uh, I want to go through this, and then we'll give an example on where, where that might apply and where we do not have to classify as a breach. Because remember, once you classify as a breach, you will have a duty to report to the individual who the breach was, um, whose information was breached, and also a duty to report to the secretary of the Office for Civil Rights. And that requirement is annually. If it's less, if it's a breach of less than 500 people, you have to report on an annual basis. If it's a breach of more than 500 people, uh, meaning you lose a laptop that has all of your patient records on it you are now required to report immediately to the secretary and also notify the media. So also not a breach um, if there's a low probability that the protected health information has been compromised based on a detailed risk assessment of at least the following factors. And the factors include the nature and extent of the protected health information, the unauthorized person who used the information, and uh, whether it was actually acquired or viewed, and the extent to which the disclosure was mitigated. So this requires actual thought process, reasoning, and analysis on why the breach or potential breach actually in itself was not a breach, because we got the information back or um, we mitigated the potential exposure. So an example of this, which is very easy, 
and this happens to every practice, we have a patient checking out, and one of our staff accidentally hands the wrong discharge form or, um, or uh, receipt to the patient. And the patient walks out of the door holding someone else's information. That may contain the cost or copay, um, maybe the code of visit, and uh, the date of visit, and maybe the, and the patient name would be on there. Um, if that's the case, and we realize immediately, and we run outside and grab the incorrect form from the patient, and we apologize, and say, we're so sorry, we gave you the wrong form, here's yours. That, in my mind, unless you know, that patient had taken a picture of the incorrect discharge form with her phone, or um, somehow had made a copy otherwise, um, I don't see that that qualifies as a breach. Because again, under our risk assessment here, um, the nature and extent of the protected health information wasn't necessarily a drug test result. Um, the person didn't know the other individual that this was about. Um, the protected health information was recovered, so we mitigated immediately, and it was not retained. So I think that that um, right there would serve as a great example on not a breach. It was an unauthorized use and disclosure, but we did our risk assessment, which I would recommend be in writing, and we decided that it does not count as unauthorized uh, breach and does not need to be reported, which is the key. So the risk assessment, if you feel that you've had a breach in the office, um, you know, I do recommend that you work with an attorney for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, they'll be positioned to be able to do the assessment, you know, assuming you have a health care lawyer, or you can obviously always call our office um, for help with something like this. And secondly, because if you are outsourcing the assessment, there will be less of um, a claim that you were biased and tried to protect yourself inappropriately. You can blame it on your lawyer. You know, my lawyer did the assessment. My lawyer told me we didn't have to report. And that's a lot safer than um, doing it internally and looking like you're just trying to, you know, save your behind and not, uh, not have a reason to report any type of potential breach. So this area is very important. I recommend that every single covered entity have on file a detailed breach notification policy um, explaining when we have a duty to report, when we do not have a duty to report, what is a breach, what is not a breach. And if you're looking for assistance with that, of course, you can contact us. We, we do have those on file. Um, enforcement. Jennifer? Yes. Jennifer, it's Ellen. Before we go into the new enforcement, let's uh, take a second here and let's hold our second poll. Oh, sorry about that. Where was that? Hey, no, that's fine. No, that's fine. You can stay right there on the new enforcement page. You're fine. Okay. All right. So, folks, we're going to launch the second poll question at this point. And this one is going to just be talking about what you're doing internally with your training. Do you periodically hold HIPAA compliance training for new and longstanding employees? And by uh, periodically, at least annually, are your employees uh, trained on HIPAA compliance, notified about the changes, do they sign off on a compliance agreement? So let's give everyone a couple of more seconds to get their responses in. We've got 75% of you responding. 80%. We'll do five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. And we're going to close the vote. All right, we've got 72% that do periodic compliance training for their employees, 22% who don't, and a 5% who are not sure. So again, those 72, Jennifer, I'll let you uh, comment, but good number. We want to see that number going up. Absolutely, Alan, and I'm so glad that we're doing training. Um, I think, you know, the one thing that I would add there is that you don't, you don't just want to do regular training, the same old training. You want to make sure that you're doing unique training to the changes, obviously, with the law. And I don't want to preach to the choir, obviously. Those of you who are listening are seeking out outside resources to make sure that you're staying in the loop, and that's fantastic. Um, the information that we're going over today is, of course, applicable to everyone on the line, um, but you want to make sure that you're also getting more specific to your particular practice, and you should speak to a healthcare attorney or specialist to come in and make sure that your policies and procedures are proper, and then also you may want to have a specific training that you know, it's particular to your practice to make sure that your staff can have all of their individual questions answered and that things are operating appropriately. Um, a big problem I see, which I want to highlight, is a lot of experts are running around and calling everything a breach. 
and a lot of practices are telling the staff the causes of the breach. That is a real problem maker right there because when you classify something as a breach, you are basically already admitting that you've done something wrong. And as we've talked about here with our standards, there's a lot of unauthorized disclosures and uses of information that technically is not tantamount to a breach. We don't want to call something a breach until we've determined that something has gone so wrong or information has been lost or, um, or, or misallocated in a way that can't be recovered and it's actually going to have, again, a, a more than a low probability of being compromised. And once we reach that level of breach, we now have a duty to report and we're going to be potentially open up to new enforcement. And we're going to go over that right now. So starting September 23rd, 2013, um, these are the new mandates for the Office for Civil Rights. Um, Everything must be investigated. And if there's willful neglect, which we'll talk about, it's a high standard, civil monetary penalties will, will absolutely be imposed. Okay? Um, so these are the level of penalties that could be assessed. We're going to go through them quickly because then I want to go through um, some, spend some time, or at least save a couple of minutes for some of our examples. So these are different levels. If you should have known by exercising reasonable diligence that information shouldn't have been disclosed how it was and there was a, a breach. Um, but you, you didn't. And it wasn't something that was so egregious. The, the minimum penalty that would be assessed would be $100, um, which could be waived, by the way, if, if they want to waive it or if something really you know, wasn't that bad and, and you could have stopped it or, or, or you, didn't, you shouldn't have stopped it or you didn't know. Um, this, this probably would be waived, but if, if the first line of defense is, is not uh, enforced and we do have a breach, the minimum assessment of penalty unless waived would be $100, not more than $50,000. Jennifer, that's a huge difference. Why $50,000 and $100,000? I'm a small medical practice. You're telling me that if I really try to do everything right but something goes wrong anyway, kind of outside of my control, first level of defense, I might have a $50,000 fine. My answer to you is no. The 50,000, remember, this, these same laws apply to the largest hospital system and the smallest individual practice. So the individual practice might get a fine of $100 or $1,000. The hospital system that has hundreds of millions of dollars, the smallest fine they may get may be $50,000 because it's a slap on the wrist for them. Second level of violation is where it's established that the violation was due to reasonable cause and not willful neglect. So what does this mean? This means that you did something wrong and you should have known better. But it doesn't mean that it was intentional. It doesn't mean that you didn't bother to fix the Windows issue that you know is coming up this spring. You didn't bother with an encryption, and uh, you don't protect your email passwords, and you leave your office unlocked. Um, you know, all of those things are more kind of willful. You willfully disregarded your responsibility. Reasonable cause is going to be um, a higher level of just not knowing, but um, not so bad that you intentionally did something wrong, and the fines obviously go up. The next level is when there's willful neglect and was timely to correct it. So if you didn't bother to adhere to any of the HIPAA laws and you didn't timely correct, uh, you did timely correct, though, once you found out something was wrong and you got in trouble for it, then the fines obviously go up to 10000 or 50000 If you have complete disregard for HIPAA, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't be on this call if you did, um, so I know that none of you are going to fall into this category, but if you decided you weren't going to pay attention to anything related to HIPAA at all, and you found out you got in trouble and you didn't correct anything, okay, then we are looking at a much higher level of fining. Minimum is 50000 per violation, um, not to exceed $1.5 million uh, per category. So these are substantial fines. Factors in considering what you're going to be fined, and I'm going to just speed this up a little bit, is um, the harm. Uh, and, and honestly, what they also take into account is how much you can pay. They look at the size of the entity and uh, whether or not it would shut you down. And what your history is, is this your first time that you've had a problem? And how bad is it? You know, what kind of policies in place do you have? Do you have any training? And, um, and they'll look at it and they'll determine what kind of assessment they want to uh, make. So there are a lot of it is in the discretion of the secretary. Um, so affirmative defenses, uh, these uh, used to be available. And um, I'm going to 
just kind of breeze through these. Um, they're not affirmative defenses. Are that you, you basically you, you should have you 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 did try to protect, um, and uh, we can use these to try to defend if there is some sort of um, audit or uh, problem that you have the officer for civil rights. So I want to spend some time going through these examples because I think that they really make things real. Um, these are all cases that happen. The links that we have here, if you want to copy them down, these lead to uh, the actual press release that was given out because of this. So this was Hospice of Northern Idaho had to pay uh, the Office for Civil Rights, the federal government, $50,000 for failure to conduct an accurate and thorough analysis of the risk the confidentiality of electronic protected health information, and because they did not adequately adopt or implement security measures sufficient to ensure the confidentiality of protected health information. What happened here was Hospice of Northern Idaho lost a laptop. It was stolen. There was patient information on there, and it wasn't protected. Um, it, you know, it wasn't password protected. There wasn't um, the ability to delete the memory of the laptop remotely in, in case it was stolen. Um, the, the information wasn't encrypted on it. It was just sitting right there on the desktop, and fewer than 500,000 people were affected. So could have been as few as 10 people or as many as, as 499. I'm not really sure what the number was. Um, but the lesson here is, is that we all have storage devices that we're utilizing to make our lives easier. Um, make sure that you're adhering to the security requirements under the security rule. Make sure you have a security policy in place dictating your terms of protection for your electronic protected health information. Make sure that you implement safeguards and perform risk assessments as needed and that things are reported when it happens. Now, the stolen laptop, the reason why they were fined wasn't because they lost the laptop. It was because they didn't have these protected measures in place, number one. And number two is because they did not report. They were required to report to the Office for Civil Rights that the laptop was stolen. They were required to report to the individuals that a breach had occurred, and they did not do this. They basically just covered it up, and that is why they were fined. So just so we're clear, it's not that the laptop is stolen. That happened, and that's okay, but we want to make sure that we, we protect. So this is a great example of looking around, why we have to look around our office and see where do we have protected health information that maybe we weren't aware of. We all have copiers, right? Well, our copiers are smarter than we are. They have memory that can basically just keep all of the documents that we put through them on file. And that's exactly what happened here to Affinity Health Plan. Affinity Health Plan returned copiers because their lease was up, and they didn't erase the stored data. This came to the attention of the Office for Civil Rights, and it, it came to light that, that Affinity had on there almost 350,000 individuals protected health information on this copy machine, okay? And Affinity now has to pay the government $1.2 million for failing to incorporate the electronic protected health information stored in the copier's hard drive into its analysis of risks and vulnerabilities. So every year Affinity, like the rest of us, has to report any type of uh, exposure that we may have under the HIPAA laws, the breaches I keep telling you, we have to report on an annual basis, they failed to disclose. And so they got hit with a massive penalty. So the lesson that I want for all of us out there is, obviously, number one, if you have copiers, erase the data. But number two, know where and when you have a responsibility to protect, support, and address your HIPAA exposure. So just very quickly, anywhere patients are, are infiltrating or in the practice, which is really everywhere, it's the front desk, it's access to your information, it's your sign-in sheet, it's people who can remote in, it's people who are taking information out, um, it's uh, physical, it's locks to the practice, it's locks to the computers, um, and administrative, it's requiring password identification specific per, per employee of the practice. So there's a lot of steps you can take. This, um, this is the final example that we have this is a dermatology practice in Massachusetts. It's a fairly large practice in multiple locations. And what happened here was an employee of the practice had a thumb drive, a very small memory disk, stolen from their car. And now, because of that, this practice, this AP Derm, has to pay $150,000 to the government for failing to conduct 
an accurate and thorough analysis of their risks and vulnerabilities, okay, and failing to comply with requirements of the breach notification rule, to have in place written policies and procedures and train workforce members. So they failed to report their breach, they didn't have policies and procedures on file, they weren't doing training, um, and they didn't report. Didn't report, didn't report, didn't report. So OCR says, as we said in healthcare, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. <clears throat> and the director says, that is what a good risk management process is all about, identifying and mitigating the risk before a bad thing happens. Covered entities of all sizes need to give priority to securing electronic protected health information. The lesson is, have written policies and procedures and train workforce members. Now, the link you see here, we'll come back to, this is our order form. We have all of these policies and procedures available for you to review on our website. So healthcarepracticecompliance.com. What's your next step? Incorporate relevant changes into your practice, um, into the privacy policies for your patients. Modify or adopt proper policies and procedures for your practice. <clears throat> Take a good, hard look at your business associates. Okay, make sure they're under proper contract and that you're not taking on unnecessary risk uh, where you don't have to. Make sure indemnification is there and that you're protected. If you need help or review on any of these contracts, you can, of course, always call our office and speak with me. Um, conduct general compliance reviews, which we can also help you with. And prepare for potential complaints for Office for Civil Rights. The Civil Rights Office, because patients can complain there for any kind of protected health information or medical record complaint or money being charged, is an office that I will say there is a decent probability that you may be hearing from during your career, especially since they're ramping up and hiring and they're now starting to do compliance reviews on their own. Um, it is a very real possibility that you may be hearing from this office and you want to make sure that we're operating compliantly just because it's the right thing to do and it's, and it's beneficial for your practice. So um, as the OCR says, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So this is from our website. Uh, we have these compliance documents. I don't have the breach notification policy listed on here but um, or the new, uh, the new HIPAA policy, but uh, we do have those on the website. It's healthcarepracticecompliance.com, and I'm happy to answer any questions about any of the policies that we do have available. And we, of course, um, we uh, offer discounts, uh, which I'm going to give you right now, 10% uh, discount. Um, until the end of March, which is, I guess, next Monday, on any compliance documents, if you put in the code MDE101, um, we also uh, are happy to customize for each practice. So uh, additional resources, um, all of you will be added to our firm newsletter for participation today. You'll be getting free Q&A from the lawyers um, specializing in healthcare. care. Uh, if you want to opt out, just email me, and I'm happy to take you off. Uh, we do have additional webinars available at our website, practicewebinars.com. And um, about our firm, I think Ellen gave a pretty good explanation in the beginning, but I'll just tell you basically we work with uh, healthcare professionals who represent physician practices, um, a few hospitals, IPAs, ACO work, and uh, we handle all transactional, regulatory compliance, audit defense, um, licensure defense, and uh, we also have other general practice areas like matrimonial and real estate and bankruptcy. And uh, we have a fairly uh, large general uh, litigation practice. So any questions you have, we also have a, an operational collections department um, for problems patients. And collections we mainly do in New York and New Jersey. Um, and uh, any questions you have, you can feel free to call me anytime or send me an email. And I just want to thank Ellen again for allowing me the opportunity to present on these very important changes to HIPAA. Um, and uh, hopefully we can do this again in the future. Okay. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate having you as our expert available. Uh, just so you know, we did have several questions that were submitted during your presentation. I'll get those over to you after uh, we end the session. And anyone else who does have any questions, there's still some time to type them into that chat window on your control panel, and Jennifer will follow up on all of them. Uh, HIPAA compliance is so important and noncompliance or violations can be quite costly as Jennifer uh, explained, even if the breach is an innocent one. Uh, so as Jennifer said, contact her at Kirschenbaum and Kirschenbaum for more information on HIPAA compliance and other legal services that can benefit your organization. Uh, I do want to just take about 30 seconds to talk a little bit about MD Everywhere. Uh, we're sponsoring this uh, and promoting this webinar where we'll have some others coming up in the future. 
but we do provide ICD-10 ready uh, purpose-built revenue cycle management technology along with a full suite of claims processing and back-end services uh, for physicians. In addition, we have a 2014 certified EHR solution. It's fully integrated to our RCM technology. So our clients end up with a single source. We end up being a single source solution provider to our clients for all of their revenue cycle, EMR, and ICD-10 needs. Uh, in addition, we have business service agreements with all of our clients, all of our vendors, and we do incorporate uh, HIPAA compliance training for all MD Everywhere employees. Our solutions are designed to aid our clients in meeting guidelines, also maximizing revenue for all their patient visits. Uh, everyone is very aware that 2014 is certain to present challenges, the likes we've never seen before. It's been decades that we're making the changes that we've got coming up. It's important to be working with a partner who can help you navigate these changes successfully. I am very, very proud uh, to let you know that MD Everywhere have, has just completed a week of ICD-10 claim submission testing that was sponsored by CMS. And uh, we were very excited to report that we yielded a 100% claim submission rate on our ICD-10 codes that we sent through to multiple pay payers. So if you're one of those uh, uh, practices or businesses out there that's still waiting for your vendor to catch up and provide you with some type of a ICD-10 friendly tool, uh, you might want to consider a conversation with MD Everywhere because time is, is October 1st is quickly approaching. We do also have an NCQA certified CVO, Credentialing Verification Organization, and a full credentialing division that make us a full service company. We've got about 7,000 uh, physicians that we are contracted to across all our lines of business, covering about 40 different specialties. So we really would probably be good for, fit for your organization too. I do want to let you know that our uh, next webinar, Jennifer, if you can flip to the next slide. Our next webinar is scheduled for April 2nd. Uh, the topic is going to be on GEMS, that's the cross-mapping ICD-9 to ICD-10 codes. It's an express webinar. It'll only be 15 minutes compared to this longer webinar. So we do invite you to register and join us next Wednesday. The registration link is on the MD Everywhere homepage. At the bottom of the page is our upcoming events, uh, www.mdeverywhere.com but register for that. It'll give you a little bit more information about the GEMS cross-mapping, the crosswalk tool. MD Everywhere is also going to be heading to Tennessee in April. We're going to be at the Tennessee MGMA conference in Gatlinburg. That's uh, April 23rd to the 25th. We're also going to be at the Tennessee Medical Association conference in Nashville, and that's April 24th to 27th. So if anyone on the call is from that area or attending any of those events, we would love to see you at those, uh, at those conferences. Uh, a couple of people have asked during the presentation, and I'll let you all know a link to today's recorded presentation will be sent out via email. It may take about 24 hours for us to convert that over, but we will we'll get it out to all registrants, and we do invite you to share it with your peers. Uh, use this information to help your office become HIPAA compliant. In closing, I do want to thank Jennifer again for her expertise and for her time today and thank all of you for attending and spending this hour with us. Uh, this will end the webinar, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.